ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له الموك وله الحمد وهو على كل شيء قدير ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم بعد. We begin by acknowledging Allah subhanahu wa taala, praising Him, seeking His assistance, His guidance, His forgiveness, proclaiming our belief and trust in Him. Those whom Allah guides, the Quran tells us, those whom Allah guides cannot be misguided by any. And those whom Allah has allowed to be misguided, and there are reasons for that. But for those whom Allah has not allowed to be given guidance, cannot be given guidance by any. We begin by affirming that none does worship, worship except Allah alone subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he has sent prophets and messengers throughout time. And we affirm that this process has concluded with the coming of Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. I would like to begin by talking about prophets. Because one of the things that prophets have in common is that when they begin their prophetic mission, they begin small, meaning that they attract small amounts of uh, followers and sometimes they don't attract followers at all. They don't, sometimes they don't attract supporters at all. And again, this is a universal truth, with the possible exception of Sayyidina Yunus alayhi salam or Jonah. He, he is perhaps uh, he is arguably the only exception to that. So, the Prophet Muhammad, the final Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he's no different. The first, his, his life, or his, his prophetic mission is divided into two parts. The Makkan part and the Medinan part. And for the first 13 years of his mission, of his, of his, of his prophetic career, he is in Mecca. And as we all know, there in Mecca, the Muslims, they face persecution. The weaker ones, I mean those who didn't have the tribal connections and such, they were people who were killed, and sometimes killed in horrific ways, and beaten and tortured and all these things. And even one of the things that happened is that the Muslims had, a, they were uh, under an economic blockade. Basically they were put out into a certain place, and, and there were rules that were made that did not allow um, the Meccans to sell to them, or give them food, or to marry them, and so on and so forth. And it's d during that situation, that uh, e even it is said that it's in that situation that Sayyidah Khadija, had the Prophet's wife, that she died. And it is said that the starvation was so bad that that they would tie stones to their to their stomachs in order to deal with the hunger, to deal with the with the with the with the situation of famine. And as we know, this changed. This changed, that, 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 at least that aspect of things changed at the, at the, at the moment of Hijra, when the, Muslim, when the Prophet, والسلام, when he makes his Hijra to Medina. The change was slow, but it occurred. Now, in Medina, the, the Messenger of Allah, Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, was confronted by many different personality types. Or I should phrase it as he was, in, he was confronted by people with, with different interests. That's a better way to put it. He was confronted with people who had different interests. And in Medina, he was a person who had, was held in regard, as we know. And even for those who did not accept his prophetic message, he was, his prophetic mission, he was still a person who was held in high regard. And he, even as we know, he takes the time to resolve some old tribal conflicts. He takes the time to do that. 
and he establishes uh, what is called the Constitution of, of Medina, in which all the parties had a say. He also encounters people who had a desire uh, for power for themselves. He encounters these types of people. Now, I'm sort of jumping ahead. It's hard to summarize uh, 23 years of, of the prophet's prophetic career in just a few minutes. So I had to jump ahead. So later on in his life, one of the, among the things that occurred were there were other people who were claiming prophethood. At least two individuals, including a woman, claimed prophethood after his death, and one during his life. One particular individual during his life claimed to be a prophet. And it is that part which I want to explore today. This person who claimed to be a prophet alongside the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this person is named Musaylima. And in our tradition, we call him Musaylima al kazab al kazab means the liar. He's known as Musaylima al kazab Musaylima the liar. And I, I want to make this as, uh, as concise as I can. See, Rasulullah, the final prophet of Allah, the authentic prophet of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is from the Quraysh. Is that right? He's from the Quraysh people, Quraysh tribe. And this person, Musaylima, is not Qurayshi. He's not Qurayshi. He's from Najd, yes, but he's not Qurayshi. Rather, he is from a tribe called the, the Banu Hanifa. Banu Hanifa. And again, this will be important as we go on. So, a little bit about Musaylama. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about his, uh, his religion per se, but the historical literature suggests that he did or said or taught certain things in order to attract followers. And basically what he would do is he would tell them what they want to hear. This is what they would do. Is that, or so he would do. He would tell them, he would tell his audience things that they want to hear. Particularly in the areas or the issues that have to do with personal behavior or personal ethics. So it is said, let's just give an example, it is said that he allowed his followers to consume alcohol, whereas the, the Prophet Muhammad والسلام, did not allow his followers to consume alcohol. The Quran does not allow the Muslims to consume alcohol. It, it was prohibited. There's a lot of... Um, confusion as to what is right or wrong with regards to the things that are attributed to Osayla. But what is clear is that he used the language and rhetoric of tribe to strengthen his appeal. He says, he says well, basically he says, look, Muhammad is from, from the Qurayshi tribe. Why can't Banu Hanifa have a prophet as well? That much is clear. You can argue about the other points, but that much is clear. And it can be said, uh, I want to be fair and I want to be reasonable in discussing this. Perhaps it's fair to say that non Qurayshis, or some non Qurayshis, felt a certain amount of resentment. That, you know, how, how come there is a, a, a prophet that emerges from, from this particular group and not from that particular group? Perhaps yeah, it's an understandable resentment. So, 
Anyway, let's continue on. Musaylama, he sends a letter to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He sends a letter. And in the letter, it's a very short letter. But in the letter, this is what he says to Rasulullah. He says, وَإِنَّ لَنَا نِفْسُ الْأَرْضِ وَإِنَّ لَنَا الْأَرْضِ He says, half of the land, and you can understand ard is meaning the land, you can understand it being the planet Earth, however you want to interpret it for your own purposes. He says, half, Musaylama says to the Prophet, he says, half of the land belongs to us, and half of it belongs to the Quraysh. To the Prophet's tribe, to the Quraysh. And again, you know that, that statement just suggests that there is again some some level of resentment that there is a prophet who is loved. There is a prophet that is from among the from from the Qurayshi tribe, from the Quraysh, but the non Qurayshis. Perhaps some of them felt a bit of resentment. Yeah, you can understand that. In today's world, we have within the Muslim world, we have the Kurds. They are a people who live in northern Iraq, western Iran, parts of Syria, and of course, major part, many areas of southern Turkey. They're a Muslim people, just like their neighbors are all the Muslim people. And the Kurds, at least in, in, uh, in Iraq, have voted to basically the former own independent country. And all the other countries, they have their fears. They don't want their countries to be broken up into small bits. So they are against that. Particularly in, 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 in the Kurds, I admit the Kurds have, have had some uh, levels of cultural suffering. They're not allowed, in Turkey, they, at least until recently, they're not allowed to speak publicly the, the Kurdish language. In Spain, if we pay attention to the news, in Spain there is a region called Catalonia which has voted to, to sort of uh, have independence from the, from the Spanish, uh, from the, from the Spanish uh, uh, rule, prompting the Spanish authorities to clamp down, to arrest its leaders and all that. So the feelings, so the feelings of injustice, or the feelings of, of marginalization, these things have to be addressed in every way or every shape that is available and possible. But returning to Rasulullah, Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. Rasulullah is not a prophet for the Quraysh. وَمَا أَوْسَوْنَكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةُ لِلْعَالَمِينَ Allah says that Allah says He is a prophet He is a mercy to every nation He wasn't, a, he wasn't an Arab prophet Yes, he's Arab, but his mission is not to Arabs only His mission is a prophet to all humanity And so one of the things about Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is that he does not speak from the perspective of Asabiya. He never speaks from the perspective of tribalism or racism or nationalism. He never uses this, this form. He never uses this language. This is one of the evidences that Muhammad was a true prophet. That he is a true prophet and messenger of God. He never speaks from the language or from the rhetoric of, 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 of race or the language or rhetoric of tribe. He doesn't do that. What did the prophet do? Our prophet, the final prophet. God's final prophet. What does he do? We have to look at his, at his life. He establishes pacts of brotherhood when he goes into Medina. Other people in history have attempted to, to imitate that. They call it uh, social experiments. Social experiments. 
In Medina, when he arrives in Medina, one of the things he does is that he pairs, for example, a rich person with a poor person, or a person from tribe A with a person from tribe B. Why does he do that? To establish pacts of brotherhood, to break down barriers like that, the, these largely artificial barriers. This is what he does. He says, he says, Kulluhum min Adam wa Adamu min Turab. He says, all humanity is from Adam. And Adam is from dust. These are the words of the, of the prophet, of God's true, authentic prophet, the seal of the prophets, the final prophet. All of mankind is from Adam. And Adam himself is from dust. The Quran, the scripture given to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deliberately made people <laughs> having different colors and different languages. He says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ خَلَقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَاقُ أَلْسِنَةَهُ وَأَلْوَانَكُمْ إِنَّ فِي ذَلَكَ لَآيَاتِ لِلْعَالِمِينَ That's what he says. He says, among his signs or evidences, God's evidences, is the creation of the heavens and the earth and the variation in your colors and, excuse me, in your languages. The variations in your, in your languages and the variations in your colors. Indeed, and these are evidences for those with knowledge. People who have some sort of education, Allah says, recognize this reality. And there's much more I could say about this part, this part, but in keeping with the prophetic sunnah we pause, seeking Allah's mercy, His forgiveness, His guidance, and praying to Him, Jalla Shatnu, that He join us with those who do have knowledge. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي ونسلم على رسوله الكريم وبعد Returning to Rasulullah, final prophet. He never tried to make his tribal affiliation or his race or his nation. He put all these in quotation marks. He never tried to make use these as the primary, or any actually any reason to 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 give him himself legitimacy, or to give his mission legitimacy. Indeed, Allah says to say, Allah tells the Prophet to say this: "Qul, inni ya yuhannasu, inni Rasulullahi ilaykum jamia." Allah tells his messenger to say, "Say, in all humanity, indeed, I am God's messenger to all of you." يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ جَمِيعًا So we mentioned that Musaylama, the, the Kadhaf, the false prophet, the liar false prophet, that Musaylama wrote a letter to the prophet, to the prophet Muhammad عليه الصلاة والسلام Prophet Muhammad replied to the letter He replied to the letter and I admit that I have, I have studied this before, and studying it afresh made me really see things I had never saw before in how Prophet Muhammad, how he deals with things, 
And I want to share some of that, if I may. So, in the, so the prophet's letter is very short to Musaylina. And I'm only going to quote the irrelevant parts. So he begins by saying, Assalamu alaikum man al huda. This is how he begins his letter to the Prophet. Uh, it's, uh, sorry, excuse me. This is how he begin how the Prophet begins his letter to Musaylima. Please forgive me for that. Please don't say that I'm trying to say that Musaylim is the Prophet. <laughs> So I believe in that firmly. <laughs> so he says, Assalamu ala mana tabar al huda, and ma ba'd. For in the order of Allah, he reads to her may a shell in a ibadi. When a ibadi, he will our people to the mutakim. This is the Prophet's letter. To Musaylima. This is his reply to Musaylima. So he begins by saying, Assalamu ala bin al huda. Peace is for those who follow the guidance. And in, in everyday Muslim discourse, Muslims use this term, this terminology. It's from the Quran actually. And the Quran has, used it, has it in different contexts. But most everyday Muslim con um, practice uses this expression, Assalamu ala bin al huda, instead of Assalamu alaikum. Everyday Muslims use this when they're when basically they're addressing those they they deem to be the kuffar, to be disbelievers. <laughs> saying the same instead of saying assalamu alaikum, they say assalamu ala man al huda. Or at, at, at the most polite way they may say wa alaik. Instead of saying assalamu alaikum wa alaikum salam, they say wa alaik. Okay. So we may use it in a polemic way, and we assume that the Rasulullah uses it in a polemic way. However, it's possible to see a different explanation, how the Prophet begins his letter. Remember, he is Rasul to all mankind, and he is not only Rasul to all mankind, the Prophet is also a mercy to all mankind. Allah's authentic Prophet is, is, is a mercy to all humanity. No other prophet is given that title in the Quran. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ No other prophet is given that, that title, that, 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 that role, that job. As-salamu ala al huda Peace is for those who follow guidance. Perhaps what the prophet is saying, he's acknowledging that Musaylima is discontented. He has a troubled heart. For whatever reason. And which is largely irrelevant to my subject. But Musaylima has a discontent. A, 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 he's discontented. He has a troubled heart. And the Prophet tells him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet tells him. He says. You want, do you, if you want to be content, if you want to be, um, have some peace in your life, then you have to submit to the guidance of Allah. That's what he tells him. Power is only going to go so far. Oh, you're a big guy. You have a lot of followers. You have a lot of money. You have a lot of women. You have a lot of this. You have a lot of that. Those things, as important and as, uh, as interesting as they are, those things can only take you so far. They have a limit. They will not bring you happiness. Allah says, Allah That indeed, the, the hearts find contentment in dhikrullah, in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet's letter continues. Again, it's a very short letter. I've actually already shared 99.9% .9 of the letter. He quotes, the Prophet quotes the, the, uh, the Quranic teaching, which says that the earth, or the land, how I want to translate al-ard, 
It belongs to God. He calls us to, uh, he, he gives it the inheritance of it to whom he wills. He ends it with that. That the end belongs to those with taqwa. It belongs to those who have true reverence and respect and fear for Allah. So Prophet Muhammad does not speak out of thin air, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. He doesn't speak out of thin air. He doesn't make things up. وَمَا يَنْتِقُوا عَنِ الْهَوَى Allah says, إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَى عَلَّمَهُ شَدِيدُ الْقُوَى The Prophet doesn't make things up. He conveys that which God wants him to convey. He doesn't convey anything other than that. He conveys that which God wants him to convey. And what he conveys is still to Musaylimah, he's conveying a message for him to return to Allah. And he's conveying to him a message that there's something bigger and more important than this Asabiya stuff that you're talking about. And that's something that's more important is Allah. This is what a true prophet of God does. He doesn't call to, to satisfy our, our, our nafs or our desires, etc. He calls it that which is true. That's what the Quran does, and this is what the Prophet does. So, obviously, again, it's, it's, it's sort of uh, hard to summarize these things in just a few minutes. I've actually gone over the time I wanted to go. Musaylama doesn't listen to the letter. He received the letter, and he's, he, he has still had a rebellion against uh, the, the mission of the Prophet uh, that existed even after the Prophet's death, alayhi So, yes, Musaylama did not personally listen to the letter, and it happens. The Prophet sent a letter to Iran, to the ruler of Iran, and he tore it up. Other, other people, they received the letters, even when they didn't accept Islam, at least they had respect for it, and, and, and as some of the reports suggest how they preserved the letters and all of that. But the ruler of Persia, he tore up the letter. Of Iran, he tore up the letter. So, you know, it can happen that, that God's prophet sends, sends, a, sends something and it doesn't succeed. That can happen. But... The message of the Prophet's letter to Musaylam, and this is what is preserved. It is preserved for us to look at now. It's, a, it's something that happened in history and that we were able to reflect upon it long after those events have passed. I believe that Everything happens by God's will and God's, God's permission. Everything, good and the bad and the ugly. It all, be, it all happens by God's will and God's permission and within the power of by God. One of, the, one of the fundamentals of our faith is That is all from God. So I believe that. So I believe that, that God allowed even for a false prophet to emerge and for this letter exchange to, to take place in order for us to derive lessons from. And this is how God works. This is how Allah works. We see the ruins of civilizations. We see, we see elements of history being preserved. And people are studying that and looking at those things for, for countless generations that follow, that to come. And I believe that the most important thing to take from this is that we have to be careful not to follow a modern Musaylimah. Whether he calls himself a prophet or not, or she calls herself a prophetess or not. We have to be careful not to follow uh, false prophets, as they call it. We have to strive for as long as Allah gives us life, we have to strive to be 
better and more connected to him. We have to be willing to strive to be better and more connected to him. وَجَاهِدُ فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِ One of the jobs of the Muslims is to strive in the path of Allah. حَقَّ uh, جِهَادِ You know, for real. Do it for real. Not, 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 this is not as fake. Do it for real. جَاهِدُ فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِ As the Prophet says in a hadith, al mujahidu man jahad al That the real mujahid is not the one who goes and joins that, that thing called ISIS. You know that thing that they made over there? That, that monster that they created? No, that's not the real jihad. al mujahidu man jahad al nafsahu. The, the mujahid, the one who makes jihad, the real mujahid is the one who strives against himself. And part of that is 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 becoming more submissive to the to the will of Allah, more submissive to the rules of Allah, more more submissive to acknowledging that what Allah says is true, and that what Allah says goes, even if it goes against our own desires, our own wishes, our own prejudices, our own attitudes. This is what it means to be a Muslim. This is what it means to be a Muslim. To be submissive in action and to be submissive in most and to me most importantly in in thinking, to be submissive to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we pray to Allah to be stronger in our following of his word and in following the Sunnah. Of his final prophet, his authentic and final prophet, his universal messenger. We pray in the words of, the, of, that, of that prophet, in the words of that universal messenger, to show us truth as truth and give us the ability to follow it. And to show us falsehood as falsehood and give us the ability to abstain therefrom. Allahumma al haqqa haqqa zubna tiba'a wa anni al baat al baat zubna shinaba. Ya muqallab al kulub, tabi kulubana ala deenik. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana. وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا لا تجعلنا مع القوم الظالمين ربنا أمنا فاكتبنا مع الشاهدين ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد حتيتنا وحب لنا من لدوك رحمة إنك أنت الوحاب ربنا إنك جامع الناس ليوم لا ريب فيه إن الله لا يخف ميعاده سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين وأقيم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على مؤمنين كتابنا وكوتا